Hello and welcome to Motor Week and on the programme tonight I'll be finding out if the new Laguna 2 from Renault really can give any kind of a match for the new Mondeo. Glenda will be checking out a nice little new Spaniard in the form of the newly restyled Seat Arosa. But first of all, is there any Gallic charm then in the new Laguna 2? So it's the weekend, you've got a bit of kit to shift around and you want to do so in a hurry. You need something then with a bit of space and a good turn of speed. Well, this should do it. No, not that, this. It's the new Renault Laguna 2, taking over from one of Renault's most successful cars ever. Now I want you to watch this very carefully, because we're going to use the special Ritchie slow-mo cam in order that you can spot one special detail, or more particularly one detail that's missing. Note, the car was locked. I didn't use a key. I used this nifty little key card. No fuss, no bother. Press the button and go. It's a trick usually found on more high-end motors from the likes of Mercedes and admittedly getting in without a key does make you feel very special before you've even turned a wheel. It's becoming a bit of a cliche to say that the French are no good at building large cars. And it's not entirely fair, it's probably more accurate to say that we're just not very good at buying large French cars. And I think part of that is because the attributes that the French have traditionally given their smaller cars, like practicality, durability, kind of utilitarian features, just don't translate into big cars. In big cars, generally, we want to feel cosseted. We want to feel we're in a luxurious and, best of all, expensive machine. And previously, they just haven't cut it. The Laguna then, when it first came out, was extremely important for Renault because it kind of started to turn that round, which makes this, the new Laguna, very important for Renault. Whereas the old Laguna was all rock and roll, and no, I don't mean dodgy headbands and air guitar, I mean it wallowed round corners, the new one has been tightened up a lot. There's nowhere near as much lean. And again, it's getting closer to that German manufactured car feel. Without actually going all the way, it still retains some of those essential French qualities. In a year or so's time, Renault introduced the new Safran, their very large car, and then the completely wild and nuts Avantime, a kind of coupe version of the Espace. And interestingly enough, it's the platform under the Laguna that's always to be found underneath Espace, so there'll be changes there as well. In other words, they're really hoping to crack the big car market, and they hope that by taking this really up market a little bit, it'll help them when they want to sell their really big cars. So are we ever going to take to big French cars? I don't know, but this is certainly a viable alternative to the German offerings. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a successful kind of girl. Have been for some time now. And image is everything to me. The kind of car I drive, it has to be the right car for me. Back there in the 80s, it was the Porsche Turbo. Fast, powerful, a bit like me, really. Then in the 90s, <laughs> well, it was the BMW, of course. Reassuringly expensive, well-built, stylish. So, in the year 2000, what do you think a girl like me drives now? Well, I've got one out front. Do you want to have a look? It's this. It's the all-new Seat Arosa. <laughs> I mean, you didn't think I could possibly afford the fuel for the Porsche nowadays. And the BMW, can't find anywhere for it to park. But this, you know, it's perfect. <laughs> Well, now I'm actually in the car, I can drop the image for a bit. You know, you don't have to have a sports car to have fun these days, and you don't have to break the bank to get a good quality car. And that's why these practical little super minis, well, 
They're selling like hotcakes. Now let's start with the build quality. This Seat is based on a very successful VW Lupo, which is a good start. And it's amazing to see things like this cup holder here is found in a much more expensive, much more high-spec Audi. In fact, all the switches and the buttons are, well, they're reassuringly German, actually, even if the car is Spanish. in talking about performance and specification I'm going to do a little experiment to show you just how practical this lovely little Seat is and for this I need um, a willing volunteer oh, you'll do yeah you come on come here quick 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 bring your bag <sighs> turn around turn around lovely right get in Although they look small on the outside, it's deceptive because you can quite easily get one, two, three, four lanky cameramen in with room left over for the gear. It's like the TARDIS in there. This is the 1.4 16 valve with the engine producing a hefty 100 horsepower, yet it's still very economical, achieving over 40 miles per gallon. Now the newer Rossa has twin headlamps in line with its bigger brothers, which gives it a more grown-up style. The body shell has also been restyled, with sporty alloy wheels coming as standard. The interior has also been given a makeover. It's funky, stylish and see it have obviously used high quality materials throughout. Look Charles, just sell the shares. Yes, sell them now, okay? Bye. All this work and no play. I thought life was supposed to be about having an enjoyable time. Well, this car's supposed to be fun. Let's go and have some. Hey, you know, this car really is quite nippy. The suspension has been developed so that it handles really well at low speeds, but then when you do put your foot on the accelerator, it stays really stable. You know, I think that Seat have done it. They've actually got a car that looks sporty and it feels sporty as well. It'll be your best friend when you're out on the open road and then when you get in the city, it's pretty good too. Say I haven't actually finalised the price for this car yet, but you can be sure that you're going to get a lot of funky little car for your money. only joking, I can't imagine many big executives trading in the BMWs for one of these little tiny Seattle Rossas, but they don't know what they're missing. It really is a practical little car. It's sporty, it's only a low insurance group, cheap to run, especially in today's economy, and most of all, it's loads and loads of fun. Hmm, fun, I wonder. Bear with me a second. Hello? Yep, Charles, hi, it's Glenda. I've decided, um, I'm not going to come back to work. I found a new free spirit. I'm going to stay and live in Spain with my new Seattle Rossa. Yes. Bye. Ha. Ra, da, 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 da. Despite the fact that the Porsche 911 is now approaching middle age, it was 37 years since the first one was launched, and that it's been through five generations and been threatened with being killed off on more than one occasion unsuccessfully, there's something rather uniquely appealing about the 911 which no other car, not even a Ferrari, can match. And despite the fact that a new 911 now costs at least £56,000, there are plenty of good used examples to be found. For instance, this, a 1979 911 SC Targa. It's done 84,000 miles, it's had three owners, it's in exceptional condition for its age, and it would cost you £12,000. 
The 911 has so many unusual quirks to it that many people are put off buying them. For instance, the rear-mounted engine, which can make them a little tail-happy in the wet. But slip behind the wheel of a 911, start up the air-cooled engine behind you, and listen to that wonderful sound. Now, finally, a good 911 can be a bit of a minefield, all the different models, variants and generations. So here's our guide on what to pay for one. A 1979 911SC target around £12,000. A 1987 911 3.2 Carrera with 100,000 miles, £15,000. An H-Reg 911 Carrera 4, 19 grand. Or how about the superb looking 911 Carrera Sport Targa 3.2 from 1988 for £17,500. So what do you need to check for on a 911? Well, certainly check all the way around the bodywork because many may have had a shunt or two and they've certainly been on track days as well, so they may have been thrashed. So a good check around all of the bodywork is essential. Make sure all the panel gaps fit correctly. The colour is the same all the way around the car. There may have been resprays and all sorts of things done. It's well worth getting a good independent Porsche specialist to check out a car like this. If you need a new clutch, that's going to cost you about two grand. Heat exchangers and exhaust systems are again expensive. <laughs> It's out on the road that will finally convince you whether to buy a 911. Once you've got used to its rather unusual habits, it's a car that can put a big smile on your face, and it's quick as well. Find a dry, clear road, floor the throttle, and you'll rock it off into the distance. And despite the fact that this is not an expensive 911, it's still got that envy appeal to other drivers who want to give you a race away from the traffic lights or tailgate you. So, have I got your mind racing that yes, you might fancy a Porsche 911? Well, my tips would be if you want one, read up and do your homework about the cars because there are lots of different models and variants available. Coupes, cabriolets, targas and turbos. Go to a specialist dealer who knows his stuff. And remember that cars over 10 years old will qualify for classic insurance, which should only cost you a few hundred pounds. So this week's used car tip is the Porsche 911. This really is one of those cars you can turn up just about anywhere in, except perhaps at a meeting of the Sensible Car Society. It's the supercharged Jaguar XKR, and we have 370 brake horsepower, and you'd be very lucky to see 14 mpg. Mind you, there is some good news because they've dropped the price recently quite a lot. You can pick one of these up for about 56 grand. Bargain! There'll be more cars after the break. Today, we have a Men & Motors world exclusive, a motoring revolution. I promise you, a vehicle the likes of which you have never, ever seen before. Get ready to be shocked. Of course, one of the frustrations of uh, concept cars, especially very expensive one-off concept cars, and this is the only one of these in the world, is that you can't really push them to the limit. Considering it's a concept vehicle that are normally amazingly flimsy, despite the fact they've spent over half a million pounds, the car feels actually very, very solid. It feels as if it's ready for the road. The other thing I like about the car is that it's actually not that big. It's not like the normal bulky 4x4, it's pretty compact, which will make it very popular with urban users. In fact, it'll be the ideal vehicle for going around the urban jungle during the week, but for those people that want to escape on a weekend and go and play in the rural jungle. And this will be the ideal dual-purpose vehicle. I love the actual, the lines, it's almost like a piece of motoring architecture. Look at these chiselled lines there, it's as if somebody has just sort of worked it out of hard metal. And at the front you've got this gorgeous grille that looks total aggression. The light, 
This little effect is what they call the Chinese tea room because these are like the windows on a Chinese tea room. It's got great flowing dynamic lines. It looks just incredible. Edges, sharp edges everywhere. You look as if you could cut yourself on it. It's got some wonderful little touches here like the special springs which were taken from the Paris Dakar rally for four by fours. And then you come to the magnificent rear. If you thought the front was pretty impressive, what about that? If that isn't the most wonderful back end of a car you've ever seen, I don't know what is. And it's full of great little touches. How about this? Open sesame. Glass roof, just to put your shopping in nice and easily. This is your box for hidden treasures. You can have everything there from cameras to computers. One of the neatest bits of kit though is the reversing window in the spare wheel, which gets rid of one of the more uh, usual nightmares of reversing a big boxy 4x4. And the best thing of all about this is that this sort of half a million pounds worth of concept car is actually totally roadworthy. Not only does it go on the tarmac, but it's also pretty impressive off-road. So let's stop talking and do some driving. If you thought the uh, exterior was pretty radical, welcome to Battlestar Galactica. I mean, this really does look like nothing on Earth. <laughs> it's, uh, I was going to do this piece, Houston, we have liftoff but I think it needs something more Japanese, like Banzai or something. It really does look as if it would be the perfect thing for a modern samurai. It looks like a battle wagon. Let's uh, take it for a spin. Automatic gearbox. Chunky, I think you would describe this. Down into drive, and off we go. I love the interior. I mean... The, the metal, this really is, uh, you know, bare metal at its finest. This is not sort of the sort of namby-pamby stuff. This is a sort of an interior for big, aggressive boys. Look at, I love the fuel indicators up here. They look like test tubes on the top there. And the speedometer is like some chronograph watch. It is, they're little minor pieces of art. So, final verdict. I've only really got one thing to say to Isuzu, apart from obviously you must build this incredible machine. And that's the name for a company that's known throughout the world for its Isuzu Trooper. There can be no other name for this vehicle but the Starship Trooper. It would take a hard-hearted soul or maybe a wig wearer not to fall in love with the idea of a convertible car once the summer sun arrives. Let's face it, even in this drizzly country, we love our soft tops. Um, yes, excuse me. Hello? In fact, you only have to change two letters to get from soft tops to soft spots. Quite an interesting point, I thought, when it comes to the beloved little... Com yes, hello? Excuse me? If there's one thing we like probably as much, if not more than, a car with a soft top, it's a car with a prestige badge. So why not try and combine the two? Which this, as you've noticed, does, yes, very well indeed. It's the Mercedes SLK, but it's the entry-level 200 compressor. And yes, all right, we'll drive it. The only thing I can't promise is the sun. It passes the first test with flying colours. Yes, it does look good. From the back, it could be pretty much any standard Mercedes saloon until you see it with the top down. From the front, it's perky but purposeful, and those deep slab sides give it a very distinctive image. But is it any good to drive? So what do you get in £26,000 worth of Mini Merc? Well, a two-litre compressor engine, which I'm told puts out 163 brake horsepower, but if I'm honest, it really doesn't feel like it. 
Round town, okay. Get out on country roads and it's not exactly exciting. It all goes through a six-speed gearbox, which is not very nice at all. Gripes aside, no doubt about it, it does definitely draw on the good looks of its bigger relative, the SL drop top. Mind you, one worry is if you buy a car to look good with its prestige badge and glamorous image, then when you're driving around town, you want to do so smoothly. The problem here is we've got a rather annoying two-position, very spongy clutch and a very numb-feeling throttle, which means when we pull away, it goes like this. Hang on to your coffee cup. <laughs> In fact, I've been making a bit of a gaffe, a horribly embarrassing blunder by referring to the little SLK as a soft top, because technically speaking, well it isn't. And if you haven't already seen the incredibly clever roof mechanism on the SLK, then you're about to. And believe me, if you've got any recollections of old convertibles like little Spitfires and Midgets where you spent half an hour breaking your fingernails off on annoying little Prestards, none of that's involved. And the end result, when the hood is up, well it doesn't look like a hood, not like some soft tops where it looks a bit weak. In the case of this, it looks great and it's very cosy. Not long ago in the course of this awful job I was called upon to test a Mercedes S-Class, their flagship car. Now that is a Mercedes, it's about 120 feet long, it costs millions of pounds and it'll last for thousands of years. The steering wheel was so big I could barely get both arms across it. That's what I expect in a Merc. To say it's not a Mercedes, well that's a little bit harsh, because it is, it says so on the front. To say it's not a sports car, well that's different, because certainly if you want a taut, finely tuned little racing car for the real driving enthusiast, you'll be looking elsewhere. If though you have a hankering for a miniature SL, a touch of Hollywood glamour but scaled down, then this could well be it. And after all, we all love a touch of glamour, and we all love a convertible. That's it for this week. Hope to see you next time on Motor Week when there'll be more fantastic cars and motoring shenanigans as always. See you then. <laughs>